Okay, very good. Well, thanks everybody for joining. I um, appreciate the uh, chance to uh, talk with you all and update you on um, uh, what our plans are for uh, eBusiness Suite, what we've been uh, doing for you recently and what we're gonna be doing uh, going forward. So what I wanna do today is cover um, uh, uh, some uh, basic points about our overall roadmap and how you can think about some of the investments that Oracle's making on your behalf, both in eBusiness Suite and in some other areas that you can benefit from when you're using eBusiness Suite. And then uh, we'll go through some um, uh, just a high level highlights of some of the things that we have done functionally and in user interface and in operational efficiency uh, to improve the system in, in recent years. Uh, make sure you're up to date with the latest capabilities that we have. And we'll talk a little bit about um, you know what it means to go from eBusiness Suite to or to have a path to the cloud from eBusiness Suite, which doesn't just mean moving off eBusiness Suite, it means how you can leverage some of our cloud capabilities while you're still on eBusiness Suite. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some comments on how you can keep up to date with what we're doing. So just to launch in, the, um, uh, there are several types of investment that we're making. And the, the first one is what you've always known, which is we're continuing to build new features and functions into eBusiness Suite. So we build new functionality, we improve the user interface, we improve the operational characteristics, you know, like the uptime of the system. And that's uh, continuing, we're, we, it's continuing as it always has. We have new releases and new features. Now, alongside of that, as you all know, we have, Oracle is building a, out a complete set of SaaS applications that cover ERP supply chain, the human capital management and the customer experience. And you could switch to that product line, which is what a lot of Oracle people will want to talk about. But while one of the, from my point of view, is a you know, in behalf of the EBS customer, the interesting thing here is there are actually lots of opportunities to take some advantage of things that are happening in that product line while you're still on EBS. So if you're still running EBS for your core operations, there are some things you can integrate to from that SaaS product line in a very sensible and practical way to take advantage of some of those investments, uh, but without having any disruptive project to have to do. And then uh, we are also building at the technology level a, a set of uh, infrastructure, which is both a general computing and hosting type of capability, sort of like Amazon Web Services. But on top of that, uh, being able to run the database as a cloud, as a service, and consume it from a licensing point of view as a subscription rather than as a perpetual license. And uh, you can also like, you know, operate our engineered systems that way. So there's some things that are unique to what we're doing in the, in the cloud infrastructure. But from the EBS customer's point of view, the interesting thing is you can actually run your EBS on that. And we're making some optimizations for how that works. So overall, from, the point of view, from your point of view as a customer running EBS for your core activities, you have all three of these investment streams that you can take advantage of short of re-implementing onto the cloud applications. You can take advantage of the new features and functions we're building into the latest releases. You can integrate to some of those SaaS application capabilities and you can take advantage of some of our platform investments uh, as well. So we'll come back and talk about each of those in turn. But first, let me just talk about the overall release roadmap that we have. So we're on currently release 12.27. Uh, if you look back at the last few years here as shown on the roadmap, you can see a pattern that we have roughly annual releases. So expect to do a, a release here at 2018 that would be 12.28. Uh, and then uh, what we're currently planning is after that, we would rather than just do a 12.29, we do a 12.29 worth of new functionality, but then in addition, we'd take a little bit longer and update the technologies under eBusiness Suite. We would pick up the new version of the middleware, the pick depend on the latest database, the latest version of Java and so forth. So we basically rebuild EBS on later technology stack components. So that would produce a 12.3 release, again, probably later than 2019, <coughs> probably sometime in 2020, that uh, will not be hard to upgrade to because, <coughs> excuse me again, I'm gonna mute for a second. So it'll not be hard release to upgrade to 
because really we're not add, we're not doing the kind of data model change that would be require you to analyze all of your reports or or figure out where how your data moved into different tables. It would just be essentially picking up the same e-business suite but rebuilt on a later version of underlying technology components. So that's the plan of record. Now we haven't said when that release would come out. And what we have said is that that release will be supported through at least 2030. So here we are in a day in a 201 X year to 2018. And we're saying you can be supported on that release through at least a 203 X year 2030 is probably beyond anybody's practical planning horizon. So the idea is you'll be fine running EBS through the 2020s at least. Uh, and you probably have to do basically one more upgrade sometime between now and then. Uh, and that's probably the way to think about it. Now, we understand that <clears throat> we have published these, uh, the current dates for 12.1 and 12.2 are 2021 and 2023. And we understand that a lot of people would like to go straight from 12.1 up to 12.3. Uh, if you just want to do the minimum number of upgrades and run for a long time, but not not doing more upgrades than you have to. So we'll take a look at these support dates as we get closer and know more precisely when we're going to be able to get the 12.3 uh, the release out. But at the moment, I wouldn't think that for your planning purposes of the 2021 date is an absolutely rigid date because we do understand that people would like to move from that directly to, to the 12.3 release. So now let me um, switch gears and go to and uh, talk a little about some of the specific things we've been uh, building in EBS and different functional areas of the product. So again, this is we're talking now about the organic, kind of the classic EBS new features type development that we've always done. So as we as we take a look at what what how we are deciding what to invest in, what the you know how we think about what projects to pick. Really think about it from two perspectives. One is we have some thematic things we're trying to do across the pro all the products, things like create more HTML interfaces, or we pick a functional theme that we're trying to drive at in a particular area and we chip away at it over the course of a number of releases. And then in addition to that, we have uh, we pay a lot of attention to customer enhancement requests and the voting that goes on in our support communities. So you, if you haven't been engaged in the support communities that are on the My Oracle support uh, site. I'd encourage you to get involved there. That's we move really the enhancement process to sort of a social networking model where you contribute an idea and other people comment on the ideas and uh, you know discuss them and then ultimately people vote. And a much more open process than the kind of classic call support and login enhancement request. And then you have no idea whether other people liked it or not or you know whatever happened to it. But this is a much more open process. So we, we have a voting uh, activity in those support communities, and we pay a lot of attention to that, and tend to do uh, a number of uh, high priority, you know, voted enhancements. So, uh, <clears throat> jumping in on particular areas now, in uh, order management, the one I'll just highlight a couple of things. We've done a lot in every area, but um, I'll highlight a couple of themes. The one that's I think most interesting in order management is something we've really been at over the course of the 12.2 release, which is improving the support for selling combinations of products and associated services. So a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of businesses are trying to move to a model of having a recurring revenue stream, or if you have a low margin product and you're try to, trying to surround that with higher margin service offerings, you know, you think of uh, selling a, you know, like way Best Buy would sell a TV at a low margin and then have a, a um, you know installation and uh, service contract type uh, subscription that's actually much higher margin than that. So uh, a lot of businesses are trying to uh, do that. So what we want to do is make it easier for people to um, handle those business models. So what we originally built in 12.2 was support for capturing in the order taking process in order management the information you need to uh, create the service contract and you actually bill the first year of the service contract out of order management and then separately it automatically goes over and behind the scenes creates the service contract for you so for example if we were to sell you e-business suite you would have a license and then you would have a support contract 
And as of 12.1, what would happen is you would actually go into order management and record the license. And then you go over to the service contracts module and you'd set up the, the service contract. Really do two disconnected transactions to record what was in effect one sale. <clears throat> and, and so what you do now is you do it all in order management. And you basically issues the first bill for support from order management. And then the other ones come out of service contract. So in addition, just to the billing aspect of it, you can configure and price and take an order for uh, combinations or models of service contracts with particular models of the products that you have. So uh, particularly like your high-end phone comes with a three-year service contract and your low-end phone comes with a two-year service contract. You can also have promotional uh, items so that if I buy two phones, you get an extra year on the service contract. So um, those are, are just some of the ideas that are supported in this basic idea of grouping, uh, pricing, configuring, and, and quoting, and taking an order for combinations of products and, uh, and repeating service contracts. So we've been adding new capabilities to that throughout 12.2. I tell you, the latest one that we added, just to give you a flavor of it, is, uh, is milestone billing. So for in a number of uh, businesses, where you ship a, a configured uh, product or something that takes some you know, installation and tuning services to you know, get it in final shape. Uh, oftentimes you have simple milestones, like 20% uh, on taking the order, 50% on shipping, and 30% on customer acceptance or after the tuning steps are done, installation and tuning steps are done. And <clears throat> many customers who have that type of requirement have had the uh, either customize or set up Oracle projects to do progress billing out of projects, which is really overkill. There's a lot of um, complexity associated with projects if you're trying to do one for every order. So what we've now got is the ability to take simple milestone payments or to bill for simple milestone payments out of order management. And you can attach those to standard order management events like booking and fulfillment. Uh, or you can create your own custom defined uh, milestones in the order cycle and attach these billing, uh, billing points to uh, progress billings to those. <coughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> that's functionally what we've been up to in order management. Now, in addition, and this theme will continue also, we have in 12.2 uh, an HTML version of the, order man the core order management screen. So in a lot of uh, cases, professionals who use these screens all the time <clears throat> often have large screens where you have, you have a much better than 1024 by 768 screen resolution. And if you resize the screen, these HTML screens resize like you would expect to show more rows. The, the classic Oracle Forms interface with the Java client doesn't actually show more rows just because you have a bigger screen. So a lot of people with you know, higher intensity uh, use of some of the <clears throat> core transactional screens in the products have been asking us for HTML versions of these screens. And so we've done that now in order management. As we go through, I'll t tell you some other areas where we've done that as well. <clears throat> in the uh, logistics area, I'll cover a couple of enhancements and some of the user interface improvements. Uh, we have a feature called flexible serial tagging. So in some businesses, you don't actually use serial numbers really throughout your manufacturing process, but maybe just to avoid uh, having, you know, competing with gray market knockoffs of your goods, you actually introduce a serial number late in the process, like at the time you ship or something way in the, late in the process. So now we let you apply a serial number <clears throat> whenever in the process, uh, you like you don't have to have a it be serial control for manufacturing uh, purposes. Another uh, you know kind of thing that was asked for by customers that we've uh, we've done in, in inventory is a uh, <clears throat> is a material a flexible material classification that you can introduce as part of the the uh, packing label. Uh, so for example, if I have the same item packed two different ways for two different types of customers. For example, if I make shock absorbers, I might pack them one way to send to <clears throat> General Motors, and I might have them pack them another way to send to AutoZone as a retailer. And <clears throat> even though it's the same part, you want different um, labels on the, uh, uh, the packaging so that you pick the right one for the customer that you're shipping to. So it could be some 
classification scheme like the type of packing. It could be a country of origin packing uh, classification. It could be any other classification you can you want that would affect uh, how you pick and ship. You could include that classification information on your on your packing slips and, and shipping labels. Now, in the warehouse management part of logistics, we've also done quite a number of things. That, uh, I could just highlight one of them here, which is uh, important. We introduced zone picking. So if you have a, a large warehouse, you can divide it into zones and you can assign uh, resources like forklifts to the particular zones and assign workers and tasks based on those zones. And you do your pick up and put away operations then specific to the zone. So ability to basically subdivide the sub inventory that you're tracking as everything in the warehouse into smaller, more manageable units for more optimal, you know, work assignment and flow management inside the warehouse. <clears throat> We've made another a number of other optimizations following on that theme uh, as well. Now, in terms of the user interface, this is another area where we put a fair bit of work into modernizing UI. So, in receiving, for example, you're receiving things into inventory. Uh, we have a we went from having an Oracle Forms interface in 12.1 to having a HTML interface that's essentially sized to operate on a tablet. So somebody doing a receiving function on a loading dock can actually do it on a tablet and have the right kind of UI that they would expect to uh, <clears throat> perform that efficiently uh, you know, without a, a desktop type client. <clears throat> We've also added the uh, shipping HTML user interface uh, for, or, um, all the shipping actions that you might want to do. And then just most recently here in 1227, we added an HTML version for the, um, uh, for the material workbench, which is really the core form for inventory material management. It lets you browse easily for uh, things that you want to, you know, to browse the different sub inventories and locators and, and find the goods that are associated with those things. So basically an easy way to visualize what, uh, and, and essentially query for subsets of the data, but in a, a much more intuitive way than you could in the forms interface. So again, all of that is a uh, capability that you get uh, when you go to 12.2. <clears throat> now, in addition, we have uh, taken the mobile supply chain apps client, which uh, was basically a telnet client. And, and now what we're seeing is that um, uh, in warehouses, people are starting to have hardened uh, Android devices, like hardened Android tablets or, or smartphones that they use on, uh, you know, out in the uh, warehouse floor. And so now we have moved the mobile supply chain apps feature set to uh, an Android, and it's available on iPhone um, uh, client uh, smartphone app as well. <clears throat> Uh, on the procurement side, we've been very active. There's a huge amount of stuff we've done. I can highlight just a few things to give you a sense of it. Um, one theme is in iProcurement, the iProcurement is the sort of self-service shopping experience within our procurement suite. And here we have with the information discovery extension, a very nice uh, consumer-like shopping experience where you search and filter and uh, you know, do have search refinements uh, like you'd expect that you have on any kind of consumer uh, shopping site. Um, and in addition, we in 12.2, we've added uh, ratings and reviews. So if in your business, um, you are requisitioning things that aren't consumer type products where you can go and find, you know, consumer reviews on, on, on consumer sites. If you're, uh, you know, buying laboratory test equipment or something that's not reviewed on consumer sites, uh, other people in your organization can review and rate those goods. And then you as the next person to come in and shop for that can benefit from understanding that, you know, other people like you who ordered this liked it or didn't like it within the context of your organization. Now, the uh, <clears throat> the other side, that's the consumer shopping, that's the you know, requisitioner shopping side of this. The flip side of it is what we do for the procurement department, because the idea is we want to have consumer like shopping, but also minimizing non-catalog spend and in fact driving the shopping behavior toward the contracts that are most favorable where your procurement department has gotten negotiated the best deals and so the procurement department can actually bias these search results and uh, set um, 
uh, essentially set the uh, settings to cause uh, certain contracts to be certain vendors or certain items from vendors to show up as preferred in this list. So if we have a better uh, contract with you know Dell than we have with Toshiba, then the Dell laptop will show up first. <clears throat> we have a new capability to guide the requisitioner to uh, catalog items. So if they start typing in a non-catalog item and entering attributes of that, like you start typing in a computer that's not your standard or a monitor that's not your standard, uh, the system will actually, based on the details you've entered, can actually suggest a catalog item. So uh, if you're, you know, uh, start entering a Samsung monitor, but Dell's are your you know, you have a contract with Dell, then it will say, hey, wait a minute, why don't you consider this this Dell item that we have a contract for? So again, try, the system is trying to drive the person buying to uh, stick with on-catalog spend. Now, also for the professional procurement uh, department user, we have uh, an ability that's, uh, you know, we're familiar from, uh, you know, Google searching in general, but this is working inside your firewall on your own procurement contracts. The ability to basically, if you want to find all the contracts that contain a certain phrase, you basically type that in and it will find all of the contracts. And then when you open up one of those contracts, it will show you all the snippets where that for, uh, text, where that phrase occurs. So uh, that's something we that a lot of people running procurement contracts have asked for, and now we've uh, delivered that. Uh, in the projects area, we have enhancements around projects and and in billing. Um, so in the on the uh, I'm sorry, the costing and the billing. So on the costing side, <clears throat> we can take uh, labor actuals either from EBS HCM or cloud HCM or really any. Uh, external uh, payroll system and interface those in now to projects to capture actual costs as opposed to relying on standard rates that you probably have in HR if somebody normally bills at uh, you know, $15 an hour then your, your project cost just reflects that but but when you bring in payroll actuals you get the fully burdened uh, cost that you're you know with all the exact calculations that affect what that uh, labor rate really what that labor cost really was so it gives you more accurate costing on the billing side we've made it more easy if you to do um, billing on a contract basis so if you're if we have if you have a contract to do several projects uh, for somebody then you can bill them on behalf of all of those projects in a consolidated way now we have a version of this that's extremely sophisticated that's used for federal contract billing that complies with all the rules involved in billing the government. So we really built this feature out originally for like aerospace and defense type uh, contractors who bill the government for very in very complex ways. But we made it general, uh, we exposed the uh, generally applicable part of it so that everybody who has a contract with multiple projects can, can benefit from what we've done. And for a lot of what we do in projects is is to serve uh, people with capital intensive projects and even in particular the engineering and construction industry where you essentially in the business of doing capital projects. And for that, we've created a, a new mechanism in projects called the schedule of values where you can model outside of the project itself, you can model the uh, earned value management hierarchy that you're going to be able to build based on. And then you can just associate nodes of your project to that, um, uh, to that, uh, to different elements of that schedule of values, and you can report on how you're progressing in terms of uh, uh, earning the value that's going to let you bill for the project. <clears throat> in the uh, asset lifecycle management area, this is really our maintenance product. The big thing we did in 12.2 was to add support for linear asset management, meaning. Uh, pipelines, transmission lines, roads, things where you might have a work order to fix a you know particular mile of the of the uh, of the asset, a particular you know linear range of the asset. Uh, but along with that, we've done some things that uh, benefit people with with all the different uh, types of maintenance that you might want to do. <clears throat> One of them was to build a disconnected mobile version of the mobile maintenance app. So the maintenance technician now can get maintenance work order information downloaded and, and be offline <clears throat> if they're in some location where they don't have uh, network connectivity. 
um, and, and still see the details of what they're supposed to do in the maintenance call. In addition, we built some nice visualizations associated with that linear asset problem, but actually they work for just regular discrete maintenance cases as well. So you could visualize a road and the segment of the road that you're going to paint, let's say, um, uh, or repair. Uh, but you could also just visualize where all your equipment is that you have to go maintain. So we have people at things like uh, companies like mining companies or uh, oil and gas companies that have uh, or, or uh, cell phone tower type companies that have a lot of different assets and the location of the asset and getting somebody to be able to go out and efficiently like locate it and know exactly what to do, you know, efficiently map, plan their route to get to the various assets uh, relies on, uh, on being able to map them easily. And so now we support that kind of mapping and visualization. Also in the uh, asset life cycle and service area is uh, field service. And here we've had a very nice uh, set of UI work to um, provide an HTML uh, interface for the field service dispatcher. Again, this is just another example of, of customers asking us to give for people who do this job all the time, they have a nice big monitor and they want to have see a lot of information. They want a nice graphical display. So we built that out now for field service, <clears throat> for teleservice, for mobile field service. You have the, the technician has a smartphone app, an iOS and Android app, and also has a, uh, a uh, uh, Windows uh, uh, laptop type support. So we really any of those platforms is appropriate for your um, field service technician to be uh, going to a call with, we know, support all of those things. So in financials, uh, which you know, virtually everybody on EBS is running, uh, we've improved uh, some things about the approval processes. Uh, uh, general, uh, general ledger journals have approvals now. There's more sophistication in AP invoice approvals with parallel approvals. Uh, in the receivable side, we've added some more sophisticated algorithms to do matching. So if you get a pay, if you get a for cash application, if you basically get a cash payment that doesn't match uh, the invoices, um, there are um, we, have, we have some sophisticated ways now to help you come up with the best match to uh, most efficiently apply uh, cash. Uh, also in the collections area, you can have sort of collection templates where uh, the idea is that for certain customers, you might want to um, send them three emails and then call them. And for other customers, maybe you want to call them right away. Uh, you can basically have sort of call plan templates for how you're going to approach collection activity. And then you can associate those to different customers. You also collect from related accounts. So if you have several subsidiaries you're, uh, who owe you money, you can, you can also just sub, you know, organize that together and, collect, and do a collection activity at the parent level. <clears throat> In the uh, HR area, the human capital management area, the, we've done a, a number of functional enhancements, but the main thing to highlight here really is that, that all of the <clears throat> self-service functions, either self-service employee functions or self-service manager functions that you might want to do in HR, uh, the vast bulk of that is now available in uh, smartphone applications. So a lot of people are concerned, you know, is the is EBS interface modern? And what we're, what we've been focused on is making sure that in particular, all of the self-service functions that would apply to a lot of people in the organization <coughs> can be done on smartphones. Because if you do activity on a smartphone, that's a modern UI almost by definition. So, so what you can do in HR, you can you know view people. A manager can view people on the team. They can drill down and see the details of any individual person. The uh, employees can maintain their absences. The managers can view the absences. The employees can manage their tax information and see pay slips. <clears throat> they can enter <clears throat> enter time cards. And managers can do approvals for HR and for procurement and expenses and the finance area and the other things we talked about, all from a single mobile approvals uh, application. You can view attachments and you know, do all the things you'd expect in that application. So <clears throat> mobile is a good opportunity if you're on EBS and you haven't rolled out mobile capabilities to your end user population. It's something you do. It actually doesn't cost anything. 
uh, from a licensing point of view, you <clears throat> these are viewed as alternate UIs for the products you already license. So for users who are already licensed for these things, you can just roll these smartphone apps out uh, to them. Um, you know, there's uh, it's the same app for 12.1 and 12.2 uh, as a downloaded app, and you download the patch that's either applicable to 12.1 or 12.2, and then you're basically up and going with the connectivity, and and uh, you're, you're set to go. So most people's barriers to deploying mobile apps are more at the policy level. You know, which which are we going to provide people phones, and you know, what how do we deal with support of phones, and what are our security policies around phones, and all of that. So, but if you have all that sorted out and you just want to take some of the apps that we have available <clears throat> that uh, you know can meet your needs around some of the EB data you have in EBS, uh, you know, you know, we encourage you to go ahead and take advantage of that. <clears throat> so uh, that was kind of a quick trip through functionality and some of the user interface work we've been doing. Uh, the uh, interesting sort of best for last, the, the, the key feature of 12.2 that probably most of you are aware of is uh, online patching. And that really remains the defining feature of 12.2. Uh, the idea is that it's uh, users can remain online while patches are being applied. No matter how long it takes the patch to actually apply, the cutover to take a downtime to come up patched is the same. You just basically bounce the system. So you have the same outage. It's a predictable outage. It should be a matter of minutes rather than hours. And <clears throat> that activity is really that improvement is really important for customers with global operations or people with manufacturing equipment that you really can't shut down. Um, people with very high uptime requirements uh, really built it for those people and largely those are the people who moved uh, you know early to 12.2. That feature under works by leveraging underlying database feature that allows us essentially to what we call addition uh, different stripes in the database so we can hold the current version of let's say the PL SQL code and the uh, that you're running and while we're also patching in a new set that you're going to be running and then you just when you restart the middle tiers they just point to a different edition in the database and, and you're all patched. <clears throat> so let me shift gears that was really the sort of organic EBS development discussion uh, some a lot of stuff about what you get when you move to 12.2 and then for those of you who are already on 12.2 some things we've done very recently I hope you benefit from that information uh, let me shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the things you can do with the SAS applications and here the idea is that uh, you that we may be able to deliver things where that have a lot of intense computational requirements and we'll put those computations in the cloud so you don't have to buy and size a machine to run that so you'll subscribe to that you won't have to install it configure it or buy a machine for it but from an end user perspective we want that to integrate nicely back into EBS so from the EBS users point of view it's just like they got a new feature or they got a new app so that's how we're trying to, in where we can, we're trying to make it so that that's uh, a way to leverage some SaaS capabilities and some of the benefits of the SaaS model while you're not really disrupting what you're already doing on EBS. <clears throat> so I'll give you a couple examples of that. One is in-memory cloud management cost service, uh, in-memory cost management cloud service. What, what this is is a costing solution, you know, largely applicable to manufacturing type environments where it, uh, it it lets you capture costs, not just the traditional manufacturing and labor direct costs and overheads, but really uh, costs that you might be accumulating anywhere that you're tracking in general ledger. So if you've accumulated um, a um, recycling or, or sort of waste management costs, or if you have other costs from you know, really anywhere that you want to allocate to be what we call the, what Gartner calls the full cost to serve. Uh, <clears throat> you want to allocate those back to your products. We provide <clears throat> um, algorithms that you can choose from to allocate costs from general ledger back to you know, individual uh, product costs. But more than that, you can simulate the impact of a low level cost change uh, on your on essentially the the cost of every model of everything you sell and then you can bring in demand information about how many of each of the things you sell your how what's your mix of, of how many units of each of your models you expect to sell 
and, and bring that all together to say, what would be the margin impact? How much more money would we make if we got, let's say, a 2% discount on memory or on capacitors or on a fastener or something that's used in like all of our products, but in different amounts throughout our products? And that's actually really important because if you're going to negotiate a discount uh, with a supplier, knowing how much that's worth to you informs how you should, you know, conduct that negotiation, you know, where how far to go in it and have it still be favorable to you and so forth. So that is what this lets you do. And the, the key thing here is that although that is possible to do, you know, step by step in, let's say, 12.1, you could do a where used report to find where all the part was used. You could create a new cost plan with that pro forma cost. You could then do a, a you know, margin analysis for a large like automotive data set, the you know, 18 level deep bill of materials <clears throat> that might take days to complete just computationally. And with this new <clears throat> solution that we have, it can take just minutes. So you can do many, many more of this, of these data points than you ever would have done uh, with, you know, the conventional EBS uh, software. And so that's why having this be a cloud service is nice. You, it, it requires a lot of computation, a lot of memory, and you don't have to buy it. You can subscribe to it. So that's the, the cloud benefit. But what you're getting is essentially just another better way to do something you're already doing EBS without disrupting anything about how you're currently running the system. So that's the kind of thing where, you know, we think is really valuable. We're trying to do more of. <clears throat> this also lets you compare your full bill of materials, your costs uh, across different production lines within a plant or between different plants or even between different countries. So maybe you're making a sub-assembly in one country and you're buying a, that same sub-assembly in another country and you can compare how your costs are so you can identify kind of best practice and, and save money by standardizing on best practice. <clears throat> and finally, the uh, product has a planning and prediction type of capability. So based on your cost trends, we can say, you know, based on energy cost trends or labor cost trends or, or commodity cost trends, this is where we think your costs could be in three to five years. And so what would your, uh, <clears throat> what would your break evens be at, at those different, uh, <clears throat> those different forecast cost points? So that's one uh, example of something that's basically, you know, just essentially like another EBS module, except you can get it on a SaaS basis and it's easy to integrate with what you're already doing in EBS. Now shift gears is something that's even a little more dramatic. And this is the idea of bringing machine learning technology uh, to the kind of e EBS problems of ERP and supply chain that, that we're familiar with. I mean, this is the kind of, computing technology that's used in uh, you know Amazon to predict which product to suggest you buy next or at Google to figure out what ad you should, you should be shown next. But here we've taken that same sort of programming set of techniques and applied it to ERP and supply chain problems. So uh, we've done, now this is all product we don't have out yet. This is all stuff we're working on, but, but just to give you a flavor of working on a variety of different areas. So just to try to make this more concrete, uh, let's consider the asset maintenance use case with work orders. So let's suppose that you're the, you're the maintenance planner and your job is to decide which technician to dispatch and what parts they ought to bring to a repair call. So you, know, you may just out of experience know the answer in many cases, but there may be more obscure cases or maybe you're newer to the position and you haven't had experience with every one of these. So we have, a in the maintenance work order screen what we're introducing here is an advise button so you can click on that and based on all the history of maintenance work orders for all of the different types of faults that have been reported over the years we can make this system with machine learning can make a prediction and say this is likely to be a particular type of failure with a particular underlying cause uh, the res we tell you what the resolution is likely to be, what type of resource is needed to go out to the, what kind of skill set is needed to go out and make the needed repair, and what materials that technician should have with them when they go out based on what's likely to be needed to fix the issue. 
And if you're the maintenance planner, you say, yeah, that looks good. I, I believe that. Then you click apply and all of that is automatically added into the maintenance work order. So what's happened there is your the, the EAM screen, the EAM work order screen that you are familiar with is still there. It's got one new button on it and a new window that pops up. And what that window is doing is it's making a web service call over to a SaaS deployed product, which it does all this computation. It's the, the, the machine learning uh, algorithms and models that are looking at all this maintenance history and making predictions about the current work orders. All of that's running in the cloud. But you and you, you buy that or subscribe to it as a cloud product. But from the point of view of an EBS customer, they just got a new button in their EAM maintenance screen. And, uh, you know, basically an expert assistant is now present in that screen that wasn't there before because you now because you, you know, subscribe to a SaaS product. So that's what we think kind of the ideal way for this to, to work is. So we have a similar thing in field service to be able to predict what a field service technician should uh, bring to a service call. <clears throat> in order management, what we're working on is a, a anomaly detection, sort of advise you as an order manager professional, maybe you're shipping, suddenly you're shipping goods to a location that isn't normal for this particular client, or you're shipping a quantity that's, you know, 100 times larger than normal to this customer. Maybe there's a, you know, some data entry issue that, that you need to be aware of. Uh, on the logistics side, you have payloads that it, it, basically if you're going to ship on time, we know that you know, if you're going to ship by 5 o'clock, we know you would have completed a certain pallet build operation by 11 o'clock. And we can tell that if that's not completed by 11 o'clock, we need to warn you that maybe something needs to be expedited because otherwise you're at risk of not making the shipment. So those are the kind of things that, that an expert system or a, or a machine learning type of uh, approach can pattern matching, can analyze and essentially alert you to conditions that you need to respond to, you know, before the final problem actually occurs. On the manufacturing side, we're doing something even deeper. We're actually looking at this idea of, of finding patterns and rather than just making individual predictions based on that, we're actually exposing the pattern itself. So the idea is if you want to, <clears throat> if you have certain metrics, that every manufacturer focuses on like quality and yield and cost and cycle time. And there's a whole set of standard factors that might be influencers of those outcomes. Basically have, we seed models that uh, uh, track that data. You can interface in machine data as well as take data from eBusiness Suite and bring that all together and then we do this machine learning type computation to say, what, what are the patterns we see? And the idea with, with both uh, uh, sort of the big data, it's, you know, sensor reading type information and structured data, like you have an e-business suite and really all of that together and come up with patterns that you probably wouldn't have been able to recognize looking only at how the machines are doing or only at your ERP data. So the idea is you might be able to find a relationship like you, have a frequent poor quality result when a particular operator was doing, you know, using the equipment and the uh, there's a particular lot of material from a particular supplier involved and there was a machine behavior, let's say the oven overheated a little bit or was at the high end of its range or something like that. So it's not like a particular just fault with the machine. It's a confluence of a product from a particular supplier and a machine behavior that together is predictive of a quality problem, but neither one individually might be enough to say that's a, a gonna be a quality problem. So that's the kind of obscure thing we're trying to do. So it's, it's sort of root cause analysis. And so if you, you can think of using this, if you have a, if you have like a, obscure problem, you think of the, um, you know, battery uh, catching on fire problems or the airbag problems and all these things have been in the news, you know, it, it comes back to some very obscure manufacturing issue where, you know, particular input and a particular manufacturing technique or machine issue kind of came together to create a weakness that turned out to be the root of this quality problem. So trying to help people find those things. Or if you're, and if you're, if you see a pattern like that, you can also be scanning as you're doing manufacturing to see the confluence, whether the confluence of variables is occurring. And if so, maybe 
if you see this this overheating thing happening, maybe then you can actually stop the batch before you invest more in it going going to completion. <clears throat> and then the final piece of this is to say, if we know we have a concern, let's suppose we figured out that a particular lot of goods from a particular supplier was involved in one quality problem, we want to go find where else well, where all of those parts were that went in where that similar set of conditions occurred, how many, which customers were those shipped to, how many of them do we still have in inventory? You want to find all of that to proactively service it or, or uh, you know, recall it or whatever is needed. Uh, we have a genealogy viewer that helps you do that. So you can trace, you know, where all the uh, parts from a particular lot of material went uh, and then, you know, take appropriate action. So that's, again, this is all this machine learning stuff, the stuff we're working on right now. I haven't got this out yet, but this, again, all this will be delivered as SaaS product, but stuff that integrates back to add, directly add value to EBS. We have other parts of the other solutions that can integrate nicely to EBS. As you have a list of them here. Um, just an obvious thing is like planning and budgeting. So if you had hype, if you don't have Hyperion and you wanted that kind of planning and budgeting and financial close management functionality uh, today, like nobody would actually buy a server and you know size it and install Hyperion on premise. Almost anybody would just subscribe to that functionality in the cloud. There's really no reason you'd probably want to. Uh, run that as your own data center activity. So there are a lot of things where the integration back to EBS is the same, whether that's cloud deployed as planning and budgeting cloud service, or whether it's on-premise as Hyperion products. Uh, it's the same exact integration. It's just that you can get the benefits of SaaS deployment. So there's a lot of edge things around EBS that are like that, that you can look at doing in the cloud, integrate back to EBS just as you do today and get experience with the cloud model and some value out of the SaaS economics, but without disrupting your EBS. <clears throat> so final general topic area here is around leveraging our cloud infrastructure. And <clears throat> to distinguish this from the idea of, of moving to SaaS applications, what we're talking about here is taking the EBS you know, that you already have and have customized users are familiar with, and we're just going to run that on some Oracle provided infrastructure. This so moving to this or taking advantage of this is more like a replatforming type of product, like project, like switching data centers or changing operating systems. It's the kind of thing the finance department doesn't really even know need to know happen. So uh, it's it's very different from you know starting over with a new set of applications and training users and moving balances and doing data conversion and all that stuff. This is just having the same system run on a different computer. But why would you, what, what's the benefit of doing that if you're kind of happy with the computers it's running on? One is that you can get some cloud economics with this. In other words, we, we are providing both the computing resources as well as the database licenses you need on a subscription basis. We even have metered offerings where you only pay for what you use. So if you picture a, uh, upgrade project where you may have a surge need for a whole bunch of environments for your integrator personnel and your testers and all that stuff and then after that you won't need those anymore the standard requirement would be to basically buy computers for all of that and buy database licenses for all of the cores on those computers where you're going to run the database and then you own that as a permanent asset even though that was only needed for a peak load so now this gives you the option to sort of have a different approach to say surge capacity needs that you might have. So that's why you get some cloud economics out of this. Uh, even though you already own the EBS licenses, you get cloud economics at the infrastructure and database level. <clears throat> but it's actually a better benefit even than that because when we are running EBS on an Oracle defined environment, we can actually do a better job of automating some of the lifecycle management capabilities than we can do when we have to write utilities that run on any choice of storage and operating system that you might make. Uh, we have to have manual steps that say, you know, set this up on your storage, set this up on your, you know, you know get the patches on your operating system, and you, you have to do all of that. But when we can control this infrastructure, we can handle all of that behind the scenes and have fewer manual steps. There's more automation, fewer operational issues. And some of those utilities, we can actually fast path because we can leverage capabilities of the infrastructure to do things like create faster cloning utilities than we could create in the, in the general case for 
uh, for on-premise. So <clears throat> all of this is reasons why there's advantage to running EBS on Oracle's uh, cloud infrastructure. Now we have a version of this. If you have issues not wanting to be not running in Oracle's data center because of data sovereignty issues with uh, different particular countries, or because you have particular uh, technical firewall or other configurations you care about, or because you have uh, connectivity between EBS and some other systems that needs to be high bandwidth and doesn't you know, work over the uh, internet from a latency perspective, any of those reasons, we have a version of this cloud infrastructure called cloud at customer, which sounds like a contradiction. <clears throat> but what it really means is that we take the same computer we would have put in our data center and we'll put it in your data center, but we'll still let you subscribe to the computer and subscribe to the database on it. And we'll still perform those management operations like applying patches uh, as a service into that environment, but physically, it's still where it would have been if it was an on-premise deployment. So <clears throat> just think flexibly about how you may be able to benefit from this in your situation, because uh, we have a lot of different kind of business models here that you could take advantage of. Um, typically, people progress to this by starting with non-production environments with like dev and test environments, and then there's the idea that maybe you have a dev and test state and you want to also configure disaster recovery. So if you had a disaster in your primary data center, <clears throat> you could <clears throat> take that capacity that you have and then reprovision it for a uh, you know production failover scenario is kick the testing off and have production failover there. And then ultimately you can progress to running you know production in this environment if that if that suits you. So what we're providing is, set of uh, templates essentially that do represent a fresh install, a demo environment, the development tools image that you need to do customization. Uh, we have a lift and shift utility. They'll take a fully configured EBS system with your customizations and your data and move the whole thing onto this cloud infrastructure. So if you have a gold test environment, you get to sort of lift and shift it into the cloud and then make copies once you're there. And then lifecycle management, once you're in the cloud, utilities that do fast cloning and add a node and you know automate the provisioning of disaster recovery. I mean, this is not all perfectly built out yet. We're still working on a lot of scenarios here, but but this is um, you know this is what we're about to basically make sure we're providing you know much automation as we can for lifecycle management of EBS that is as automated as it can possibly be if we if you're you know using our infrastructure. So uh, let me just close out here with a few comments. Uh, so I think one is just to make sure reinforce this conceptual distinction we've we've had. A lot of everybody feels like they need a journey to the clouds uh, plan, and so I've really given you I think three different ideas to keep distinct. One is that you could replatform your EBS. You could start with Dev and Test, and then have disaster recovery, and then even maybe production on our cloud infrastructure. That's still EBS, but running on our cloud infrastructure. The next idea is you could extend what you're doing EBS with uh, SaaS applications. So hybrid deployments, part EBS, part SaaS. Hybrid is the new normal. There's a lot of examples where that makes sense. And those are distinct from the third idea, which would be to basically re-implement your EBS, stop using EBS for a particular function, and instead use the SaaS applications for that, which is a valid idea. That's something that, that you, know, you may... Uh, want to do either in the short term or the long term. If you're going to do it, it suggests that you do it either by pillar, like move HCM, but leave ERP behind, that kind of thing, or do it by, if you're even if you're doing ERP, do it by product line or country and region. There's, there's approaches to doing this. Everybody wants a phased plan. There's approaches to doing this that, uh, you know, if you have various business activities, whether it's by country or by region that are not tightly integrated together, you can move one of those, leave the other ones behind and kind of phase it that way. <clears throat> what we generally don't recommend is that you recommend you avoid is complex integration scenarios. Some people say, well, I'll run all the products that I can run in SaaS, but for the ones they don't have yet or that aren't up to what I need, uh, we'll run, keep running those in EBS. That, that kind of thought process will tend to produce a complex integration set of requirements, which uh, could well be very problematic. Uh, so I encourage you to think of these other ways to, you know, to, if you want to move on to the SaaS product line, um, you know, follow these other approaches that are less likely to have those problems. 
So uh, just to wrap up, um, there's a lot of material like this type of information I've been doing today, as well as drill downs in lots of different product areas uh, in a free resource called education.oracle.com slash subscription slash EBS. So even though it says subscriptions and there is a paid version of this subscription, there's hundreds of hours of video that's out there that's free. So I'd encourage you to you know pass that around and take advantage of that. And for those of you who just want an update, a kind of like 30 minute update on what we did in our very latest release. If you're, uh, you know, studied 12.2 at a point in time, you just want to true up your knowledge to reflect the very latest. We have a, a single 30 minute recording out there where I'll cover all the, where I've covered all the 12.27 new features uh, directly. Uh, this is just a pointer, some additional resources that uh, we can tell you more detail about what we have in, in the latest releases. And uh, so just kind of the takeaway here is that, again, three as EBS customer, while you're still running EBS for your core activities, three ideas. One is get the take up the latest features and functions we've been building, the latest you upgrade to 12.2, late, implement latest features, extend with SaaS apps and replatform either dev and test or ultimately working your way to production on our cloud infrastructure. So uh, with that, we have a just a couple of minutes left. Uh, Jeannie, do you have any questions that have come in over the chat? I'm yes, Jeannie, sure. you can, you can uh, yeah. ask the questions now. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, the first question is, can you please explain what is being done with Oracle EBS to help with the new FASB standards for revenue recognition and operating leases? Yes, uh, we are um, uh, we are working on a uh, solution for we are we are working on a solution that will uh, do the associated uh, accounting uh, that you need to track the new. Um, uh, you basically have to put this stuff on a balance out of the right of use asset and then a liability for your future lease payments and then do a set of accounting transactions to. Um, uh, you know, affect those balance sheet items as you as you make payments. Uh, so that's a new uh, requirement called IFRS 16, and we are um, working on a uh, solution for that uh, that we'll just make available to uh, EBS customers. So um, that's um, I can't tell you exactly when that's going to come, but but uh, stay tuned for that because that's uh, pretty far along. Great. So Cliff, you cover the operating leases. Um, can you comment on the revenue management side? Yeah, revenue. We have a solution now called uh, 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 is, is a cloud revenue management product. So there's a SaaS product that was built to work with all the product lines. So it's a cloud product, sort of like I was describing with costing. It's a cloud product that works with us, our cloud SaaS uh, financials, but also works with EBS. So you, that's the that's the product that you can use if you have these revenue recognition requirements. Great, thank you. Uh, one additional question, which is uh, how customizations work with new releases and is anything changing with these new releases that you're talking about? Um, no, customization is pretty much like it has been. You, you, um, we have you know personalization frameworks for forms and OA framework that allow you to have protected customizations uh, that uh, survive uh, receiving new versions of the underlying screens. Uh, if you you know in, invasively modify the, the screens or uh, you know uh, add your own schema extensions and then modify the screens to refer to your own data elements, do all those kinds of things beyond the scope of flex fields. Uh, then, you know, when you get a new version of the screen, then you've got to reapply those. So it's uh, not uh, uh, not anything uh, uh, new there. Okay, thanks, Cliff. Uh, I think that's the all the questions that I see in the chat. Okay. Yes, uh, sorry, go ahead. I think that's it for us. Is uh, Scott, do you want to wrap up? Yes, uh, Scott's having mic issues, so I'm going to uh, wrap up. A uh, lot of uh, attendees have asked for a copy of the presentation. So we have recorded this uh, webinar. We will be putting that on the website. And uh, there will also be a link to the PDF, which I will uh, get from Cliff uh, um, you know, sometime today. And yep. the other thing we'd like to also remind you is that we have a series of webinars. And I'd like to share uh, my screen. And uh, you know, if you could go to the website, which is smartdocservices slash EBS Summit, you'll actually have a link